I am Louise Folcard and I'm in the cane workshop where I restore people's rat and cane furniture. I've just finished this one and I'm just pegging off all the little holes to stop all this wonderful cane that I've just woven from unravelling and then it'll go back to the customer and then I'll get another one on the table. There's a pile in front of me of all these broken chairs which is what I do every day here and upstairs is a wonderful gallery of local crafts as well so you must come to the cane workshop. When I'm not restoring customers' chairs, I also make award-winning jams and preserves. So I've got a whole range from chutney to marmalade, which I won the silver again this year at Dale Moon Marmalade Festival. So uh, Diamond, it's nice here, isn't it? It's beautiful. You know, good, good route. Really nice to be here. Nice view. But it was uh, pretty hard to uh, get on the top here. So it was very, bike. It's a very steep climb. But we uh, we hope we can enjoy the decent. <laughs> yeah. Isn't also a, a lovely place, uh, it's, Diamond? It's, it's beautiful. Uh, very uh, friendly people. Yeah, it's amazing. We're Amanda and Paul Carroll, um, and we are the proprietors of Templecroft Bed and Breakfast here in Alston. Um, and we have been here uh, three years, just gone, past April, um, and this is our first year um, with all of the problems we've had, obviously, with COVID, etc., where we've um, started to run properly uh, and set up so that we can run this whole business every day, which is what we're aiming to do and what we um, have done in the summer so far. Um, we are mainly geared up for walkers and cyclists. We have uh, rooms that can be configured for groups and for singles as well as doubles. And we also have our pride um, is our bunk house, which uh, sleeps eight. So altogether here we can sleep 17 people. Paul? Well, yeah, just to add that, you know, flexibility is our... Uh our intention really so our beds could be configured in triples uh, we have zip and link beds so you can have twins and doubles etc uh, and another thing is we have um, a purpose-built dry room for people coming off the moor or off the roads uh, and a secure bike lock up with uh, bike racks etc and a maintenance area so as Amanda said it's really um, you know outdoor enthusiast cyclers cyclists, walkers, uh, that we're geared up to uh, cater for. Although, having said that, it's a very cosy atmosphere here and uh, it's certainly the sort of place that you could come into as an oasis of calm. We're all, although we're right in the middle of Alston uh, and very convenient for pubs and shops, etc., uh, it does feel very uh, restful and quiet and peaceful here and lots of people have commented on that. So... Uh, we are walled in, so to speak, aren't we? Yeah, we have a walled garden, a lovely garden Lots here. Of trees and mature shrubs to hide behind. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so it, it's very much uh, people who like the outdoors because that's the sort of people that come to Alston. But it's also a, a little oasis of, of calm as well for everybody here. Um, yep. Yeah, so we really are enjoying what we're doing. Um, 
we both came from very different uh, backgrounds, but we wanted to do this and we've wanted to do this for a long time. Um, so it's really living the dream for us. We just uh, want to keep on track, keep busy um, and hopefully get some return customers. Everyone who's been so far has been very complimentary, been lovely. Uh, and it's just been great fun. Real buzz. <laughs> as well as the bed and breakfast, we do offer evening meals as well. Just a limited menu. The what's in the pot menu, i.e. we make it. Uh, and if it's there and you fancy it, that's great. But if not, that's great as well. So we sort of batch cook things. And then that's available, uh, small menu for people who perhaps don't want to go to the pub or just want a, a cosy night in. So, And that's been very successful. It has, yeah. Paul's an excellent chef. Uh, so, <laughs> so it's wonderful casseroles, hearty, hearty fare um, and, and pies and things that, as Paul says, he can make in advance. Um, and then we've got them ready for people who uh, are hungry, tired, wet and just want to chill when they get here. Um, yeah. We don't have a license yet. No. Um, but there are three or four really great pubs. Um, in Alston so within, within two minutes yeah, walk or less <laughs> 30 seconds walk in yeah. a couple of cases so that's not really a problem at the moment no is it? So. not at all it is you know despite the fact that we're quiet in this oasis we're extremely convenient for all sorts of other amenities that Alston has to offer Nook's become a new popular haunt from the hard side since the hard side closed their burnt down rather. The Nook's fantastic, food's good, coffee's good, views are absolutely stunning. Alston's a bike as mecca, it's absolutely superb. The, the staff are really nice, very, very helpful, and the food's excellent. Hi, I'm Elaine Edgar and I'm the owner manager of the Nook Farm Shop, just two miles north of Alston on the A689 on the site of the Epiacum Roman Fort. We opened here in November 2019, just three months before Covid lockdown, but um, this has been a long held ambition to create facilities for the Roman Fort but also to develop a visitor attraction for the local area and, and you know, um, fundamentally to put Alston on the map and we feel that we've made great strides towards that. We, we have a small cafe and farm shop and we are open every day of the week um, and we have loads and loads of customers arriving daily with us, bikers, cyclists, walkers, visitors to the area, people who are staying staying locally in in holiday cottages and hotels and it's just a great place to work and to be our customers really love it The Nook's a great place to work at and it's lovely to see so many returning visitors and how, how, how the business has grown so fast as well. Um, we have a great team of staff and um, everybody that works here is really knowledgeable of the local area so we, we, we don't just promote ourselves, we recommend lots of places in the local area to visit as well. Now we are going to Alston Town. Welcome to the Swan's Head. My name's Julie Coonan, one of the owners, and uh, basically not a pub anymore, but welcome to our little Aladdin's Cave where we sell everything from local crafts, antiques and vintage, clothes and everything. I think if you need it, you'll probably find it here somewhere, but uh, just a place to come where you can have a good look around and uh, lots of interesting things that will take you back in time and just hopefully give you a good afternoon's entertainment and maybe you might even buy something if we're lucky. But welcome anyway, thank you.
Hi, my name's Chris. I'm up from the Midlands just as a holiday. And it's a lovely place, Alston. The shops are lovely. The people are nice inside, all friendly when I got in them. Just a nice to peruse without any wash. It was nice. Bauer. I've lived in Alston for 36 years. I run a knitwear design business here which I've been doing for 38 years um, and just love Alston, just the lifestyle and the people. I'm Sophie Houdiger. I've lived in Alston for 16 years now on and off because I've had to go back to Suffolk on occasions to teach. Um, I've run my business so fluffy in Alston now for the last three years, um, once I gave up teaching. Um, and I'm here at the brew house with Julia now. Yeah, we set up the brew house uh, two years ago during the COVID pandemic. We found this property together and decided to set up our own studios here. And then decided that there was a spare room that we could run workshops and makers mornings in. It's been so nice not having to have all of our equipment and things in our own homes. It was very limiting um, with space and creativity, having to restrict what you could do. And here at the brew house, we've got so much more room. We can both be more creative. Working together, we can bounce ideas off each other. And obviously having the space to be able to invite people in to be creative as well has, has just brought about so many more opportunities. And it's so lovely to have people here um, watching what they do, sharing ideas, watching them help each other. It's just so nice to see how kind people are and it, it sort of restores your faith in human nature and it's just been a great experience and a great place for people to to be and to share. And It's, it's just been a really good experience, hasn't yeah. it? It's really nice. Yeah, definitely. Now we are going to Nantan. My name's Sean Griffith-Jones. I'm one of the directors here, which is a, a voluntary group who help run the hive at Nenthead. I moved to Nenthead about eight years ago now and became involved after a couple of years when the project was in its infancy. Um, this building, it's the old Methodist chapel, and it was built in 1873. Although, interestingly, there was a building on this site, a previous chapel, but it didn't last very long, um, about 50 years, I think, but it wasn't very sound, so they took it down and built this lovely building. Um, so 1873 we have on our timeline, which is lovely, and the last service in this chapel in Nenthead was in the early 2000s. And then the place was closed down. It was no longer used. Uh, somebody bought it, but didn't manage to do what they wanted with it. 
And then a group of locals in the village, half a dozen people or so, got together and decided they wanted to try and revive the building, to, to give some life back to the centre of the village. And those people, those six, eight people, got together and formed a company. And once they'd formed a company, they could apply for lottery money. And it was the National Lottery, the Heritage Fund, that helped fund the renovation and the restoration of this building. That was a long process. The bids had to be put in, the money was given, the building was bought, contractors were brought on board. The building work actually started in about 2017, I think, and finally finished in 2019. The building, as I say, was the old Methodist chapel. The organ, which is behind me, was completely taken out and restored. The downstairs space is very much as it was, but with the addition of a kitchen so that it can be run now as a cafe and an event space. This upstairs space where we're sitting was the original upstairs gallery with raked flooring. That was all flattened out. We had a lift put in so it's accessible, an office space, a meeting room. This is now an exhibition area, also used for workshops and things like that. We opened at the end of June 2019, so we've had quite a rocky three years when you consider the lockdown and the pandemic and the subsequent lockdowns, but we're still here, we're still going. We get lots of people visiting. We're well supported by the locals, which is great. Some of them came in initially a little, a little bit trepidatious, thinking, will it look so different from when they actually attended services here? But they came in and they said, it still feels and looks like the chapel did, even though it's got extra bits and we understand why you've done that. But it was almost a, a sigh of relief that they could still recognise it as a place that they worshipped in and that was important for them. And we've tried to keep that. So we're quite proud of the fact that we've managed that. The space now is used for, as I say, it's a, it's a cafe. We're open five days a week. Um, we have events here of an evening. We have lots of cyclists stopping because we're actually on the coast-to-coast -coast route, which is excellent. Other things that we've managed to put on, we've had, uh, we have uh, retirement dinners for people. It's a lovely space if you, if you use it for a private function. And we've done funeral teas as well. Um, we did think about doing weddings, but we're not quite big enough, really. It would be too much for us but uh, we may investigate that in the future we also have locally the nenthead mines where people go they ha often have open days and they will go visit there and actually go underground safely with guides and sometimes we've had events where people will go down the mines and then come back here for a, a pie and pea supper warm them up after they've been down in the mines We've tried to incorporate a lot of the original features when the renovation was done. Most of the windows, it's original glass. Some had to be replaced because of breakages, but the windows are absolutely stunning. There's a beautiful red and blue glass, and the two roundel windows, which are downstairs in the main foyer, are gorgeous to look at. Um, we've also, obviously as a chapel, it, the downstairs was full of pews. Now, not, we couldn't use all of those because we needed a workable, usable space for a business. Some have been kept and they're still here as seating, but the remainders were sold off uh, so that any locals who wanted them, that had a specific connection to them, they've been bought and they're now in private homes, which is a, a lovely reminder for them of the chapel. There were the original cast iron radiators which we also kept and used. Those that we could, some were a bit too far gone, but those that we could, they were restored and are now being reused in the original building. Um, the flooring downstairs, similarly, that's the original wood and the original altar and the pulpit. There is a Bible that is on the pulpit that we found in the chapel during the restoration 
and with the help of a local resident who has a connection with the chapel, that was restored and that is now displayed. So again, a lovely reminder for those people who came here to worship. We've also had some of the original Methodist preachers coming back to preach or to talk to the public in this space where they originally preached to a congregation. And there's that lovely connection with the churches on Alston Moor. So we're very pleased with that. Community Shop and Post Office. Uh, we took over this building in 2007 on a 99 year lease and turned it into this community shop. The post office part here that is open five days a week in the mornings and the shop is open seven days a week. We cater for the Luton community with supplying of everything that they need and wear bread, milk, and everyday essentials. We don't expect people to come in here and do the full shop, but um, we at least like people to come in, all the locals come in and buy the odd things which they haven't collected from elsewhere. This building before it was a shop was the reading rooms for the, um, the mines, Nenthead Mines. And it was uh, opened up so that the miners could actually come in here like a library type thing. and. Uh, for you know, all the time the mines were open, that was what that was being used for. When the mines closed, the over 60s club here actually took it over and had it as a little meeting room, which we used to use for several different things. Um, but then after that, uh, the what was the community shop here, which was privately run, um, that closed down, and the community said, well, we desperately need a shop in this area. So, um, we all got together and uh, bought shares and took over the lease of this building and hence that is where we are today. We're with a, a thriving little business. We have four staff which we pay uh, paid staff on a part-time basis. We also have um, three of us which are volunteers. Without the volunteers, the shop couldn't run. The one of them does the computer work, one does the um, ordering and collection from cash and carry. I myself do finance and uh, and also get collecting stock and such like. And that's the way we keep running. It's absolutely fantastic business. All the locals use it, and that's how we want to continue. Next door to, of course, we have the Penhome uh, Cycle Shop with Dave which is he's always very very busy uh, with his cycles now a fantastic cycle engineer Hi I'm Dave Rayside I run North Pennine Cycles here in Nantet a uh, bit of a lifesaver for coast to coast riders we get many thousands of them a year I also do anyone's bike who wants to bring it along which is quite a few people this one here has been to the Italian Al Alps and it's now getting a complete rebuild yeah um, I've been here 12 years and I find working here an absolute joy, right? They're in the highest village in England, in spite of counterclaims. Hi. 
I'm Lawson Robinson. I moved to Nantel in 1969. And it was the best move we ever made from County Durham. I was a coal miner. And for a, since I retired, I'm making small houses for the air ambulance people. So I, I sell them for the air ambulance and I've got a garden full of them. And anybody can come and see my garden and it's all free of charge, obviously. I'll show you how the houses are actually made. We moved from a small shop in County Durham to Nenthead House. It's a big house in Nenthead. But the slight problem was it was derelict. So it was my dad's idea to move here and uh, we cautioned it. But anyway, it turned out to be the best move we ever made. Always found plenty of work in then Ted. And it was a good thing leaving the pits. Well, this is the house I've just finished. It's a, um, well, you'd call a farmhouse. And it takes two and a half days to make one that size. And I make them for the air ambulance, sell them for the air ambulance people. Now this stone, this is pebbles from the garden centre. And they make a lovely house. But you can use any stone from anywhere. This is the local brown stone. And this is a bird house I've just finished this morning. And the secret is you're not trying to build it. It's lying flat on your workbench. And there's the mud in the mould. So you make your motor, put blanks in where your windows are going, fill that up with cement and get a handful of chippings, any chippings, and you're just pushing them in like that. So it takes half an hour, three quarters of an hour, and that's finished. And then you knock them out, and then you, you put your windows in. And there's the birdhouse I've put together on an aluminium plate. The sections, you take all the wood off and you just stand the four sections up and join it together. And that's your birdhouse finish, there's just the roof to go on. Now the roofs on them, I use aluminium. So what I do, I cut the aluminium like that and that would go on there. And you cover that up with aluminium first. And then you'll come with your... <coughs> Slates. You cut the slates to the shape, so you get a, a normal slate and just cut it to that shape and then it will go in on top of that. So you put your roof on, that's just one slate with grooves cut in. Instead of faffing about with single slates, just use one slate with the grooves in. Now you must stop any water running down, the same as a normal house. So I've got a copper pipe, half inch copper pipe cut in half, and it makes a perfect guttering. So you put that in, you can see there the water runs off the roof, into there and off the end, not down the house. Now the windows, I used to use wood for the windows, now that was a mistake. You've got to cut the wood, that's in, the dampness gets in and the wind is starting dropping out. So what I use now is plastic. You glue your plastic to the glass and make your window up like that and then your window comes in from the inside and you cement it in. So it, they never move. So that solved that problem. <laughs>
Now we are going to Garagil. Trevor Cook, uh, this is Ashkill Woodlands. Uh, we've got a 50 acre Sitka spruce plantation here that we are trying to manage in a, a slightly different way. Um, we've got a, a woodland that hasn't really been managed since it was planted and has got quite overgrown and uh, needs thinning out. What we're trying to do here is find a way of making um, it work um, financially to convert it over to mixed woodland by thinning and then replanting uh, within the areas made by thinning. So to do that we've started with the first stage of the process which is just thinning out the timber. What we'd like to do is produce something like this where we've got a mixed um, woodland which is what maybe 30% broadleaf and 70% Sitka. Um, unfortunately what we've got to start off with is, we'll show you, to try and make all this a bit more viable financially. Um, we've looked at what we can do with leisure activities within the woods. Um, we've got lots and lots of thinnings of timber which is sort of up to around about 8 inch uh, as it comes out. So one of the things we're doing is offering people the option to come and do activities within the woods. And one of those activities is this, which is building a log cabin kit. Um, basically, one of these can be built from scratch within about four hours. Um, we also show you how the timber's processed to get the knots in so that you can slot it together um, and then assemble it. Um, we also do other activities such as forging and we've also got a, um, a certificated site status so that you can do camping here as well it's very basic camping it's just um, basically somewhere to put your tent um, and compost loose and bring your own water so when we're um, preparing the logs to make the log cabins to take the bark off because the um, the tree or the um, log lasts a lot longer when the bark's stripped off it because what you get underneath it is quite a collection of little bugs and um, various things growing that then soak into the top layer of the stick and start rotting it away so what Emily's doing here is stripping the, the bark off it takes a bit of time a bit of patience but it's worth doing. What's happening here is this is how we make the joints that hold the log cabin together. Um, it's a series of saw cuts and then 
chip out the wood and it makes a thing called a knock um, and that with a bit of shaping holds onto the timber below it and makes a really strong joint um, and these are just being made with hand tools in there but you can also do it with a machine um, This is um, a finished product, what you can end up looking like. It usually takes about four to five hours to build one from scratch uh, because we, we do all the shaping and peeling before you come up to do the activity. Um, but uh, as I say, once, once it's slotted together, you can put a nice moss roof on and... Go in there and hide. The other activities we do is, um, is being able to experience having to go forging a bit of metal. Um, what Tom's doing here is making um, a little camping cutlery set. So I'll be making a, a knife and a fork and uh, a little spit so you can, when you've caught your rabbit, you can spit roast it on the fire. Um, it's all fired up with charcoal, but we do use where we can as much of the offcuts of timber. Uh, that are lying around. So, um, we've also got an old potter's wheel and uh, you're welcome to come and have a go at that. Um, we can at uh, with plenty of notice we can arrange a potter who actually knows what they're doing to come and help you um, if not if you just want to have a play you can actually dig a bit of clay out of the stream bed and come and have a bit of a go um, it's entertaining and messy there you go My love never had a hold on me but when she finally slips away she left me bound I crept tight To the mansion banister Drunker than a forest fire On a lonely Father's Day We can be bad and good together We can love each other loud I'm lighter than a feather I'll hardly make a sound I'll go with you even if it's going to Alston Town. Well, my name's Clive Seal and um, I moved up to Alston in 19, 1991, April it was, and I came to work in the coal mines because um, I was a coal miner back at home. I left school in 1980 and gone down the pits. And sadly, everything had closed back where I was, so we did look for somewhere new to move to. Now, Alston, it is a mining town, of course it is, it, it, but basically it was a lead mining town, lead and then zinc. But coal has always played a part, and the coal mining industry was really tied up with a lime burning. So when I moved up in 19, 1991, there was five little coal, coal mines working uh, and they were worked on license from the National Coal Board. So they weren't all owned by the coal board. And the coal in Alston, it's, it's anthracite. It's, it'll only burn on a, an enclosed, enclosed sort of stove like an agar. 
So in the old days, most of the coal was used for lime burning. It wasn't really for the domestic market. Now, being a coal miner, I've always been really, really interested in the, uh, in the history as well. So when I moved up here, I started looking into the, into the history of the pits. And another thing I should say, really, when you do relocate, you're always worried about, um, well, are you going to be accepted? Especially in the early, early 1990s, we did think of moving to South Wales to work. Um, but there we thought, well, will people speak to us? And it was a bit of a worry moving up here. But I must say how welcoming the people were. There was none of the, oh, he's coming up here taking our jobs. There was none of that. Everybody made you fit in. In fact, I'd, I'd turned up in the November to work for Frank Shepherd just to do a day. Like, that was your interview, do a day's work. And I'd met some of the lads then in the November. And when I came back in the April, it was as though, well, there weren't a job then in the November. But when I came back in the April, it's like I'd known them for ages. Oh, good to see you again. So everybody made you feel really, really welcome. So when I started looking into the history, the middle of the 1600s, and with the coal being different, it wasn't good for burning on the fire. They used to mix it with clay, and they called it, well, they called them cats. And if you go up to Clargill, in the valley there, there's a, there's a clough, and it's called Cat's Clough. So we think that's perhaps where we're, they, they were digging the clay out to mix with the coal. So we sort of trace it up to the 1600s, right on the top of Hartside. Um, and it's really interesting up there. There's a lot of remains. We've got records of the different boundaries uh, and the different disputes there were with people poaching coal. And then when you come back into the town itself, we sort of found records around Clargill Clough around the late 1700s of, uh, of them giving leases out, advertising for leases. And it says then that that was the place where most of the coal for Alston came from. This was the biggest boon to people who lived in Alston when they wanted coal, the, the railway line here. And the railway line goes back to the early 1850s. And the first train that came along this railway line actually brought coal in from Lamley Colliery. Uh, and there's a, a sad story attached to that as well, because there was four young lads from Slagiford. One of them was called Joseph Teasdale. And you can imagine it was, um, it was, a, it was a big day all around here. There was brass bands behind us, it was like football services, there was people perched waiting for these trains to come in around about half past ten in the morning and I bet they'd had a fair bit to drink by then as well. So these four young lads had jumped on the back of the coal wagons when it came through Slagiford and by the time the train was coming into the station here, the train had to stop suddenly because of uh, people on the track and the lads just sort of were sat on the back of the coal wagons and when the train set off again with a jerk, the young lad Joseph fell off the back and he went under the wheels of the, the wagon behind him uh, and it killed him sadly. So that was the opening day of the railway here. His mate nearly got killed and they took him to the hotel up there. But the day carried on and they had a big party, brass bands. But the opening of this railway helped bring domestic fuel into Alston from outside up at, up at Midjome and Lamley and Cornwood. In fact, when there was a national strike in the 1870s, there was actually a coal famine in, uh, in Alston itself. As you know, it's Alston Moor, so there's lots of limestone, and the lime was used to put on the land um, to bring up the pH, because it's very peaty soil, and it had quite an export out of the uh, district as well. So the pits were small, family orientated, and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of record about them. Most people have tended to, well, they've tended to look at the lead mines and the zinc mines and leave the coal mines to one side, because they were classed as not important. But it wasn't until the 1950s and 60s, it was certainly the 1960s, when the council started putting in the Rayburns and the park rays in the houses, and then these pits really came into their own because Olsen coal wheat being anthracite burns fantastic on the, on the Argus and the Rayburns. Now, as I said, they're only small pits on license from the coal board using old methods. Um, and it, again, it was a family orientated business. Now, when I came up to work, I worked for the Shepherds. Uh, I worked for Frank Shepherd up at Barrow Colliery, and his brother John, his brother John had Ale Colliery. Their dad, Stan, had come here from Prudder, um, and he'd been manager at Barrow, then manager over at Ale, and then they'd, they'd inherited Ale, Ale Colliery. So a lot of families have been invested in the coal mining industry for generation upon generation. Uh, same with now, the last working pits up here, and it's the Shepherds, uh, and they're on about the fourth generation now on Alston Moor working the pit. 
No, they, they were very old fashioned and the, the coal itself, the little limestone seam, well, it's only about that high and it, it's worked by traditional methods using windy picks. It's all hand getting, hand balling uh, and hard work, but it used to be quite very well paid. So it was very important for the Alston um, economy. There's not a lot of jobs up here apart from agriculture. Uh, there was the foundry obviously, and that closed. Um, the lime industry died. So the pits were, even though they, they didn't employ many, maybe a hundred, hundred and odd with, with, with the you know ancillary sort of things connected to it, they were important because the wages were quite good. And it helped keep local business and it kept people in the town working here. So when I moved up in 1991, I think there was five little pits working. There was Blagle, Clargle, Ale, Barath, Tows Bank, right on the, the boundary there where, where the anthracite measures stop. But then in Holtwistle, there was Alan Wardle with the Blenkinsop collieries. And they employed about 100 men. Uh, and that was really extremely well paid. So coal mining was, even in the 1990s, was still important for the, for the local economy. Uh, and you get some lads, they'd just come to the pit and they'd work for the, for the winter and they'd go off working on other things in the summer uh, and leave the pits with just a hard core of men through the summer developing again for the winter. And during the peak, well certainly at Ale, there'd be maybe 15 hewers, something similar at Clargle. So, you know, there was a big demand for the coal. Frank used to take it up to Gretna. Um, he used to go down the Tyne, he used to go all over the place at Alston Anthracite, it's a fantastic coal. But sadly, certainly come the year two, well, the big change came in 1994 when the coal mining industry was denationalised. British coal ceased to exist. Um, and that changed the licensing agreement because it on license to the National Coal Board and now there was no National Coal Board. So it put a great financial strain on the owners when it came to insurance. Uh, just before 1994, um, very historically speaking, it was important. Now women were banned from working underground in 1840, but Barrow Colliery on Alston Moor was the first pit legally in this country, well in Great Britain, that had a woman miner working underground again. And that was Angela Elliott up at Frank's. Um, so that was a massive historic marker. And she worked underground. She didn't, you know, work on the screens or in the office. <laughs> she actually went underground uh, and worked. So following the denationalization, um, one or two places closed because they couldn't afford to keep going. And eventually, there was just really ale that was left. Uh, Frank closed Barraf in the year 2000. Clargle went following year with a foot and mouth. And sadly, Blenkinsop collieries in Holtwistle, they closed as well around about the year 2000. So there was just ale left. But there was other pressures put on the industry then, um, different laws and rules and regulations, which made it, especially with working with compressed air tools, uh, it, it made it very hard to carry on where basically they said you weren't allowed to use the tools anymore so mining temporarily ceased the year 2004 we gave up at Hill we'd been sort of contracting the underground me, Jez Cooper and Brian Thompson have been, uh, and Stephen Shepherd for a while have been contracting the underground work for, for John and Kevin uh, and it, it temporarily closed in the year 2000, 2004 we just couldn't make a living anymore and thankfully after about four or five years, Kevin opened up again with, his, with some of his sons who'd returned out of the building business and decided to work in the mining industry themselves. So all those hundreds and hundreds of years in mining that probably goes right back to the Romans who were possibly here for the lead and the silver content, mining's still alive and well. So after the pit shut, I thought, well, what can I do now? Um, so I, I started off window cleaning. A mate of mine said he'd helped me start up a window cleaning round and I absolutely hated heights. So I started cleaning windows um, and we set, set up a bit of a round round Alston and the first day I went cleaning the windows, I think I was doing Ian Sorrells at the top of the street and I got the ladders up doing the top windows and I'm scared stiff of heights and I was kind of welded to the top of the ladder on the window like that, cheek to the window. And I thought, Clive lad, it's either this or Frank Bird's chicken factory. So a sharp got used to the heights, 
but it was a funny transition. I remember canvassing round the furs, and um, this guy came to the door, and his little lad said, "Who's that, Dad?" I said, "It's only the window cleaner." And I thought, "I've been a pitman for 40, for 24 years. I'm a pitman, not a window cleaner." It was a funny transition, but thankfully we managed to get the the round up and running, and it's great that I could we could find work in Alston, round Nenthead, Garrigal, um, because it's it's such a great area. It was it was partly better because I met more and more people uh, in the community and now my sons they've developed around we, we split it and they come up and work up here as well I mean we do work other places we go across the Hexham go across to the lakes and even down towards T-Bay it's a, a totally different feel to the, to the people and also more the, the community and I really enjoy when I'm working here because it's higher 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 um, so Olsen is a it, it is it's a special kind of place without sounding Clutzy, if you know what I mean, uh, cliches, but it, it has a lovely feel to it. Um, and certainly, when you start looking into the history, people help you out. There's bags of history here, uh, and it's a wonderful place to come and visit and a wonderful place to come and live. Welcome to St Augustine's Church. It's the biggest and possibly the most beautiful church on the moor, certainly the biggest and most beautiful building that's open to the public on Al in Alston. And it's open every day for people to come in and visit, to have a look around, to enjoy, to sit and play, to reflect, just to enjoy the space. And we often have tourists coming in. So though the church has only been here since 1870, it's a really historic building. It's got lots of wonderful features, gorgeous windows to have a look at, uh, paintings behind the altar, which have got a great significance, which we'll talk about in a minute, the Derwentwater clock, which dates back to the Jacobite Rebellion, and so much else worth seeing and the bells to listen to as well, which you'll know very well if you've lived in Alston for any length of time. You'll hear them on a Sunday morning. It's the home of a worshipping community. We meet every Sunday at 11 and at other times and anyone is welcome to come in to join us for part of a service or all of a service whenever you like. And many of you will be here for weddings and baptisms and for sad occasions like funerals as well. So it is a building for the whole community. Everyone's welcome to use it at any time and we're delighted to welcome you both here or to any of the other churches on the moor whenever you want to be here. One of the wonderful things about a building like this is that the space can be used for so many things. And particularly in the summer, we often have art exhibitions here. You can see at the moment there's an exhibition by Alati, the Alston Landscape Art Town Initiative, with paintings and photographs by local artists, and also quite a number from uh, children from the local schools, our wonderful schools who are part of what's going on here as well. We often have concerts in the, in the summer too, whether with local musicians and bands or with people coming from further afield, uh, on one occasion even as far away as Russia, we had a male voice choir. This year we have a choir from Blampton, which is not quite so far, but equally exciting. If you're coming into the church, it's worth coming right up close to the altar up here to look at the artwork behind it. The central uh, um, panels uh, depict the lamb on the altar from the Book of Revelation with saints all around, and they're quite beautiful. But especially interesting are the panels on either side, St. Alban over here and St. George over here. If you look closely, you'll see that both the saints have the same face. And the face is actually the face of the war poet Noel Oxland, who was killed in the First World War in 1915. His father was the vicar here, and when he lost his son, he was absolutely distraught, as you'll imagine, and had the paintings added to the Leila Doss behind the altar as a memorial to his son. Sadly, William Oxland, the vicar, uh, was so broken by this that he retired less than two years later, but the paintings are still here over a century later to remind us of Noel and his writings and what he meant to his father. amazing historic towns around Alston. Alston itself, of course, being the setting of the Oliver Twist movie, but um, a lot more uh, there is to experience around this area. 
um, the drive up in itself is an experience that one will never forget. The only thing I can um, compare it to is uh, perhaps going through uh, uh, the Rockies in, in, in North America. Um, but it's far more gorgeous than that. So I recommend that everyone in their lifetime should at least once drive to Alston. Um, there are a number of really friendly um, shops and businesses in Alston, in Barnard Castle, and, and all the little towns around here. People are incredibly welcoming. Um, the, the whole economy is set up to support and offer the best to everyone who shops around here. There are farmer uh, shops and farmer markets. Uh, there's everything you could ever dream of in, in, in perhaps a movie setting that you could experience here. whose cannon would roar. With barges tied up to the banks of the hull, some of them empty, some more than full, breasted two and three deep with their grain and their oils, captains puffing on briars among ropes laid in coils. Where barges and ships from all over the world hear the This film shows only a fraction of what there is to see and do there, so come and visit to fully enjoy the experience. <laughs>